Good morning, everyone. My name is Nadine Faza, and I'm one of the structural heart disease imagers at Houston Methodist. Welcome to the Houston Methodist Grand Rounds. We are thrilled to have Dr. Mara Guerrero from Mayo Clinic join us today to give us an update on transcatheter mitral valve replacement. You can submit your questions by going to pollev.com, entering Debakey. Alternatively, you can text Debakey to 37607 and text in your message. It's an honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Mara Guerrero, who is a renowned pioneer in the field of structural heart disease interventions. She's an interventional cardiologist and professor of medicine at Mayo Clinic. She obtained her medical degree in Mexico before completing internal medicine residency and cardiology fellowship training at the Chicago Medical School. After completing interventional cardiology fellowship at William Beaumont Hospital, she worked at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit for 10 years, where she established the Structural Heart Disease Program and the Structural Heart Disease Intervention Fel Fellowship Program. She served as a Director of Cardiac Structural Interventions at Evanston Hospital, Illinois from 2015 to 2018 before joining Mayo Clinic. Her main area of interest is transcatheter mitral valve replacement. She leads a multi-center global registry of transcatheter mitral valve replacement in native mitral valve disease due to severe mitral annular calcification. She is the phys physician sponsor and national principal investigator of the FDA-approved IDE Mitral 1 and Mitral 2 clinical trials. She also serves as a national co-PI for other transcatheter valve repair and replacement clinical trials, such as the Partner 3 Aortic and Mitral Valve and Valve Registries and the Encircle Pivotal Trial. Dr. Guerrero, it's a pleasure having you with us today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the invitation and for the kind introduction. It's really an honor for me to be here with you. And um, 2022 is an important year, as you know, we're celebrating 20 years of TAVR, but we must not forget about the mitral valve, and it's been a 10-year journey. Um, and I hope to uh, summarize for you uh, what has happened in the last uh, 10 years. Um, this is my disclosure, so I just participated in multiple uh, trials, that's uh, all. Our learning objectives today will be to distinguish different patient populations who are candidates for transcatheter mitral valve replacement, to evaluate early and contemporary outcomes of transcatheter mitral valve replacement, and to describe the ongoing clinical trials evaluating TMVR. So these are the patient populations that may benefit from TMVR. It is important that we talk about all four of them because we have learned from all different platforms. Um, on the left, we do see uh, patients who have failed bioprosthesis or failed pri prior repairs with uh, surgical rings or native calcified valves. So this patient's population can benefit from the use of an aortic transcatheter device. And then you, we do have the non-calcified native mitral valves. These patients definitely need devices that are designed for the mitral valve. But in the process of doing mitral valve and valve, valve and ring and valve and mac, we have learned important lessons and we are applying them to improve the outcomes of TMVR in native mitral valve, not calcified mitral valve. So we started with the use and off-label use of uh, aortic devices as mentioned earlier. This is one of the first reports from the TBT data. And uh, very early, we have noticed the difference between outcomes in patients who are treated for mitral valve and valve, who have the best outcomes with the lowest mortality at 30 days compared with valve and ring and with valve and MAC. And um, these patients are different patients patient populations, but also the procedures are different. So there are different factors that play in this difference. But um, this has been noticed in multiple studies. So the prior one was from the TBT uh, registry here on the left. We have a single center in Europe uh, that also noticed the same. Valvin Mac had the worst outcomes with high mortality at uh, one in two years. And this on the right is the multi-center registry led by the Cedar sinai team that also noticed higher mortality in valvin MAC compared with valvin valve and valvin ring. This is early experience, as mentioned earlier. But this has changed uh, with time. In the Vivid registry and the TVT uh, for mitral valvin valve, the 30-day mortality was around 8 to 9%, but we were able to decrease that to 3.3% in the mitral trial when we treated all these patients with transeptal access. And um, we can, uh, you could say that uh, this, uh, this is a highly selected group of patients with uh, highly experienced operators. And we wanted to know if this improved uh, lower mortality could be reproduced in the real world. So what we did 
is um, we evaluated um, a little bit more contemporary outcomes just with the uh, sapien 3 valve in the TBT data. And we uh, compared transeptal versus transapical axis. And for the first time in this analysis, we were able to demonstrate that actually transeptal axis per se was associated with lower mortality at one year. So now we have confirmed that in, um, in this analysis. So important to select transeptal axis if the patient has favorable anatomy. So with that approach in the mitral trial, our one-year mortality was 3.3%, and this is in a patient population with highest TS score, mean uh, of 9.4. And this mortality was the same at one year, 3.3, and at two years, 6.7%. And now we just presented the three-year data at ACC and it did not change. So it was the same mortality. So the survival, 93% at three years. So the same story um, happens again, much better outcomes in value and VAB compared with value and ring and value and MAC. So outstanding survival, 93% at one year. So we know this valve and valve procedures have been approved by the FDA in 2017 for high-risk patients. Uh, we are conducting a study, a prospective study in intermediate risk patients as a partner three registry, and we completed enrollment of 50 patients at 16 sites last year. So we hope to be able to share with you this year uh, some data in the intermediate risk patient population. So now changing topics to valve and ring. Same story, early experience, higher mortality for valve and ring was higher in the double digits, 11, 13% in the VIVID and TVT registries, respectively. When we started uh, selecting only transeptal access, we were able to reduce that to 6.6%. And um, in this patient population, in the mitral trial, the one-year mortality was 23%, and the 30-day mortality was 6.7% in a patient population with an STS score of 7.6. So it was lower than predicted by the STS score. And when you compare the one-year mortality of 23% with the one-year mortality that we see in all comers, at least in the US, in the TBT registry, all comers uh, of patients treated with MitraClip, there's not much difference. So um, I think this is uh, very favorable compared with a very well-established technology with a good track record, which is transcatheter edge-to-edge repair with mitral clip. At two years, the mortality in the mitral trial for a valvin ring was 43%, also similar to um, this devices that are designed for the mitral valve, like Tendine, which I'll show you in a moment. So based on this data, as well as the TVT data, the FDA approved trans transcatheter mitral valvin ring for high-risk patients about a year ago last year uh, in May. We learned from this analysis in the mitral trial that patients who receive smaller size transcatheter valves, particularly in the mitral valve ring cohort, tend to have higher gradients. So just wanted to show this slide to, um, to let you know that patients who are treated with a smaller valve, particularly with a rigid ring, can have high gradients. So one take home message was to avoid rigid rings if possible, and particularly the small ones, because this um, is, not, is not good. So a, a subsequent analysis from the more contemporary um, data using the sapin 3 for the valvin ring in the TVT uh, database, uh, we found that over time, what you can see at the bottom is the 30-day uh, mortality according to the years. And over time, that has decreased. So it started uh, with the double digits as mentioned earlier, and we were able to reproduce in the real world uh, better outcomes with a mortality very similar to what we found in the mitral trial, only 6.4%. What you see at the bottom in this dark line is the use of transapical axis, and the gray line represents transeptal axis. So over time, transeptal axis has continued to increase and now is a predominant uh, mode of access. And with that transition, in addition to more experience and operators, uh, we were able to decrease the outcome. So this is very favorable. And um, we are planning to present the one-year outcomes next week at TBT. Now, changing topics to the third chapter of the presentation is Valvin Mac. This is the highest risk uh, patient population that I have seen. 
Um, these patients have uh, multiple comorbidities, they're older, they have a high risk, you know, even before they present with valvular dysfunction and um, very difficult to treat also because of the technical challenges that the calcium um, uh, gives you during surgery. So that's why these patients most of the time are considered high surgical risk for, for all the reasons that I mentioned above, and many are not treated. Um, this was uh, really understudied until until recently, probably until the last uh, decade. So we, we did not know much about it until recently. Um, this uh, paper was published yesterday. This is a study that we conducted at Mayo Clinic. We looked at uh, more than 24,000 echoes, and we um, tried to understand the prevalence. This is all commerce echoes at Mayo Clinic, and we actually found that MAC was present at least on echo in 23% of those patients. And when MAC was associated with mitral valve dysfunction, the uh, all-cause mortality over time was much higher in those patients, which is represented by the, by the red uh, solid line here. So MAC and mitral valve dysfunction was bad for um, mortality. And what's also important to note is that um, MAC alone even without mitral valve dysfunction, just by the presence of MAC, the survival was already compromised and it was similar to patients who had mitral valve dysfunction and no MAC represented by the blue line. So they overlap. So MAC is bad just by itself and it's even worse when it's associated with mitral valve dysfunction. And from the same analysis, we found that patients who have MAC and mitral valve dysfunction tend to have more... Um, a higher proportion of mitral stenosis compared with the patients who have no MAC and mitral valve dysfunction. So 6.6% in patients with MAC versus less than 1% in patients without MAC. And then if you look at patients on the right side of mitral stenosis in MAC, uh, these patients were more frequently associated with multivalvular dysfunction, particularly aortic stenosis, or a prior aortic valve replacement, or sometimes even LVOT obstruction just from the heavily calcified anterior mitral leaflet. And uh, the proportion of this uh, coexistent uh, aortic dysfunction was much higher if the patients presented with stenosis in MAC uh, compared with mitral regurgitation in MAC. Now, from the same analysis, we also found that uh, patients who were treated patients who had MAC and mitral valve dysfunction who received intervention had higher survival than patients who did not receive intervention. So it's important that we treat these patients, but how to treat them? As you may remember, the early experience with valve and MAC was not that great. On the left side, we have the results of the uh, first uh, uh, registry that collected the very first cases around the world. This is a TMVR in MAC Global Registry and the 30-day mortality was 25%. But these patients had a very, very high SD score of 15.3%. At one year, the mortality was 53.7%. And uh, as mentioned earlier from the uh, TMVR registry um, led by the Sira Sinai team, the one-year mortality that they saw was even higher. So at 30 day was 34% and at one year, 62.0%. So a very, very high risk. Initially, that's because there were problems that uh, we were not aware of, and uh, we have learned to deal with them. So these have been the main challenges. Valve embolization, paravalvular leak, and many of the paravalvular leak cases are associated with hemolysis, and then LVOT obstruction. But we have been able to pre predict and prevent valve embolization as well as LVOT obstruction. And just by learning to um, prevent these two important complications, the outcomes have improved. Uh, we know LVOT obstruction was the most uh, independent uh, predictor of one-year mortality in the TMVR in my global registry. This is the most catastrophic complication that you can see in the cath lab. So it's important to avoid it. We have now learned to predict it and to prevent it. There are two types of uh, prevention strategies that you can offer to the patients according to anatomy. So you do have septal reduction strategies 
where, for example, you can prevent uh, obstruction by doing preemptive alcohol septal ablation three or four weeks prior to the procedure. But for patients who do not have favorable anatomy for alcohol ablation due to the lack of a good septal target, or patients who do not have adequate response to an alcohol septal ablation, you, do, you can do radiofrequency ablation. And um, that has given us also very favorable results. You can also have uh, anterior leaflet strategies, uh, which can be surgical with surgical resection of the anterior leaflet or the percutaneous laceration of the anterior leaflet, also known as lampoon. And uh, it doesn't, I think, matter uh, much which one you select. What's more important is that you do something to decrease the risk of LVOT obstruction. And this is a typical case where um, you have a thickness of the basal septum, uh, you place the virtual valve, which is illustrated in pink, you know, using this computer software, and you can see that there's important reduction in the space in the LVOT. You do preemptive alcohol septal ablation, and this is a repeat CT scan three to four weeks later with um, septal uh, thickness significantly reduced. You place the virtual valve, and now there's more space in the LVOT, and now this is how it looks after valve in MAC um, that was done successfully without LVOT obstruction. Uh, we conducted a multi-center uh, registry uh, experience of uh, preemptive alcohol septal ablation. And what you do see here is the uh, incremental size in the LBOT space with alcohol septal ablation, where the baseline median neo LBOT was 85%, that it increased um, to 112. But that's not necessarily going to be enough in all patients. Sometimes, despite alcohol septal ablation, you still have high risk. And, uh, you need to do a percutaneous laceration of the anterior leaflet. So this is the importance of the neo LVOT. So what we do see here is the frame LVOT, which is uh, where we measure um, the neo LVOT space. But here is the skirt neo LVOT. So the skirt neo LVOT is where the skirt ends because when you do, I'm sorry, you may have obstruction even after a lampoon just from the skirt. So it's important that we measure the skirt neo LVOT to determine if somebody is going to have good response to percutaneous laceration of the anterior leaflet without having obstruction. So this is how we measure the neo LVOT and the skirt neo LVOT. And based on those measurements, we select how we are going to treat these patients. So if our neo LVOT is less than 200, then and if the neo, the scorneal VT is also less than 200, that's when we consider a septal reduction strategy, uh, either alcohol or radiofrequency ablation. But if your scorneal VT is more than 200 millimeters square, which is considered, um, you know, the safety kind of um, measurement, those patients could potentially be treated with lampoon without having to do alcohol ablation. So with those strategies in the mitral trial, particularly using alcohol septal ablation because we didn't do lampoon in, in mitral one, we were able to improve the outcomes. So patients who were treated with transeptal access, the 30-day mortality was 6.7% in a patient population with an ST score of 8.6%. In the transatrial access, these patients were treated half with transatrial access and the surgical access. Uh, and the other half with transeptal access, which was not randomized, was based on anatomy, but open surgical transatrial access had a 30-day mortality of 21.4% in this early experience compared with 6.7% with transeptal access. Now, a one-year, all comers, like both groups, the one-year mortality was 33% which is not much different, again, compared with the TBT data um, used in mitral clip, uh, particularly for the functional MR, the secondary MR, which was 31% at one year. So again, not much different than mitral clip in the United States. In a two year, the, in the mitral trial, the, the third year mortality was 39.9%. Again, if you compare now this with TAVR in partner one, um, TAVR, two-year mortality uh, was 43%. So it's very similar to the early experience with, with TAVR. So I consider that um, very favorable. So these are the three-year outcomes. So now uh, uh, you do see the red line at three years is 50% survival. So remember, compared with the TMVR in my global registry and, and the one-year mortality at that time was 
Now we're talking the three-year mortality is 50% in a very high-risk patient population in mitral one, which was the first prospective study. The other important thing we learned from the study is that the performance of the transcatheter valve remains stable even at three years in all three groups. So this is also very encouraging. We now are contacting mitral two, uh, which has two separate arms. We're mostly focusing on, on transeptal access for the reasons that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we think that is better for patients. So if the patients have a CT max score more than seven, which I'll tell you, I'll tell you in a few minutes what that is, and if they have favorable anatomy, so they, those patients can be treated in the transeptal arm. But if they don't have favorable anatomy or patients do not want to have an intervention, we want to enroll those patients in the natural history of disease registry to be able to generate data on the outcomes of these patients, as well as the rate of progression of mitral valve dysfunction. So now we're switching to the last chapter of, um, of this presentation of this journey, and that's the use of dedicated um, transcatheter devices for native mitral valve disease, particularly the NAT calcified. There are so many devices and um, there's no time to present, present them all. So I'm going to focus mostly on the ones that already have pivotal trials that are ongoing in the United States. Um, this is uh, the Tendine uh, device that is the only one that has approval in, in Europe already. Uh, this is a transapical device that um, has uh, the uh, a capability of virtually eliminate completely the presence of mitral regurgitation in most patients. In the initial report of the first 100 patients, um, this patient population had an STS score of 7.9%. And what we found here was interprocedural mortality was 0%, and the 30 day mortality was 6%. So for the first time, a transcatheter um, mitral device was uh, you know, produced or resulted in a 30-day mortality that was lower than the SDS uh, score. And there was impressive reduction in the degree of mitral regurgitation with most of them having none or trivial mitral regurgitation at one year and significant improvement of symptoms that was sustained also at one year. Uh, the one-year mortality was 26%. Again, compared with, uh, with Metroclip or with Tavert was very similar. And uh, due to the favorable outcomes, this device received CE mark approval uh, since January of 2020. Now the two-year outcomes were recently published and the, four, the two-year the two mortality was 41% uh, in this patient population. And the uh, reduction of mitral regurgitation was sustained with most of them none or trivial MR at two years. The, the uh, improvement of symptoms was also sustained at two years and there was improvement in the quality of life. Importantly, there was also reduction in the rate of hospitalization compared with prior to the interventions. And um, now they have experience in MAC as well. Uh, this is a, a publication of the first nine patients treated with an impressive 0% mortality at 30 days in this uh, high-risk patient population. And a subsequent publication of the first 20 patients now shows a one-year mortality of 40%, which is almost identical to the one-year mortality in mitral trial that I just showed you of 39.9%. So high-risk patient population that still had higher mortality at one year. And uh, now they do have a pivotal trial ongoing, in, and this is a summit trial. This is the only ongoing pivotal trial that has a randomized arm of uh, transapical TMVR with a tendine device randomized to mitroclip in patients who have favorable anatomy for mitroclip. And for patients who do not have favorable anatomy for mitroclip, they have two arms one specifically dedicated for calcified um, mitral annulus or MAC, and one for non-calcified mitral annulus. And the Apollo trial that started with a randomized arm and later on disappeared uh, also added a MAC registry. And um, now with the uh, transeptal, it started with transepical axis and now with the transeptal axis, I think we'll have a randomized arm hopefully uh, soon again. 
Now, the encircled trial is the other um, pivotal trial ongoing in the United States. This is transeptal. This is um, evaluating the CPN M3 valve system. And um, in this trial, we uh, are aiming to enroll up to 300 patients, high uh, surgical risk patients who do not have favorable anatomy for edge to edge repair with metric clip. And um, we also allow the inclusion of patients who had a prior uh, surgical repair with a ring if the anatomy is suitable for this device. But also a few days ago, just added a MAC registry to this trial as well, as well for patients who have favorable anatomy. So three important pivotal trials and the three of them have recently added a MAC arm, which is very nice to see. So now we, you have many devices, right? And now those devices are enrolling patients with MAC. So the question that people used to ask a lot before is, okay, with the many devices, including uh, the aortic devices in MAC, as well as the mitral devices for MAC or no MAC, um, they used to ask me, okay, how much is enough, is much enough calcium for a uh, sapien valve in MAC? Or how much is too much calcium for a self-expanding mitral valve? So because of that question and because we wanted to establish a more um, systematic way to, uh, to grade max severity, um, we established this CT-based max score where uh, we looked at four different anatomic uh, features, including calcium thickness, calcium distribution, trigon involvement, and leaflet involvement. And we give points according to the severity as you see in this slide. And I won't spend too much time here because I, I'm sure you have seen this paper already. So these are examples of what we would call a mild moderate or severe MAC based on this um, CT-based MAC score. What we did is in the TMVR in MAC Global Registry, we looked at CT scans uh, that had adequate quality for analysis. We then excluded patients who were treated with transatrial access because, you know, during open surgical transatrial access, surgeons can play sutures and that could uh, bias the outcomes, particularly the rate of embolization. So we wanted to evaluate if the CT max score could predict embolization. So we looked at transeptal and transepical cases. Prior to doing that, we tested the reproducibility of the score with three independent readers, including an advanced imaging expert, as well as an interventional cardiologist and a pre-med student. And there was good correlation uh, with the three of them. So these patients had a mean max score of 7.4. And what you do see here, the green dots represent cases that went well without complications. The red dots are patients who had embolization and the blue dots, patients who had migration of the transcatheter valve. And what we found is patients who had a max score of seven or greater, you know, most of these patients did not have migration or embolization, but if the score was six or less, there was a dramatic, very high rate of either valve migration or embolization of 60%, and that was highly statistically significant. So based on those findings, if we see a max score of six or less, we do not recommend the use of a sapien 3 in MAC because of the high-risk embolization, and these patients should be treated with a transcatheter valve that is designed for the mitral valve with specific anchoring mechanism to prevent embolization. But if the max score is seven or greater, then you could treat these patients depending on the anatomy with either a sapien 3 or with a dedicated transcatheter mitral valve. And that's what we currently use in our involving algorithm at our institution. When we see these patients who are symptomatic, we look at the surgical risk and if this risk is low um, or intermediate, then we look at um, whether or not there are MAC-related technical challenges, which is usually the case because patients who come to us have very severe MAC. But um, if they have no MAC-related um, uh, challenges, they, these patients could be treated with standard uh, mitral valve replacement. But if the calcium is too much, they could be enrolled in the CITRAL trial, which is evaluating the use of uh, the SAPIN device with an open transatrial um, the, uh, access, or you could consider an off-label use of the transatrial valve in MAC. But in our institution, the ones who come to us are usually high risk. Uh, 
So then we look at the max score. If the score is six or less, like I say, we don't dare or we should not dare to use a, a sleeping device. So for these patients, we try to get them uh, to one of the MAC arms that I already mentioned in the ongoing pivotal trials. But if the MAC score is seven, seven or greater, then some of them can still be included in one of these trials, but uh, could also be treated with transeptal valve in MAC. So then we look at the risk of LVT obstruction. If the risk is low, then they can be enrolled in the mitral tooth trial in the transeptal valve in MAC arm. But if the risk is high, we could uh, consider alcohol septal ablation or radiofrequency ablation or lampoon or all of the above. And that if the risk is lower, then proceed with transeptal valve in MAC. And if not, then we could consider medical treatment versus transatrial valve in MAC or surgery. And now we also have an evolving algorithm for non-calcified valves, which start with looking at the LVEF and then systolic dimensions, basically looking at co-opt uh, type of patients, right? If patients are not the type of co-op patients, for example, patients with very, very severe heart failure, LV, EF less than 20% or very dilated ventricles, there's no data that any intervention in the mitral valve is going to improve outcome. So these patients, you know, are should not be treated uh, or should be treated in a clinical trial that is evaluating the new therapy versus uh, guideline direct and medical treatment. But if they have co-op type of anatomy, and the anatomy is favorable for transcatheter edge to edge repair, then you could include these patients in randomized trials, either randomized trials that are, are evaluating uh, transcatheter repair therapies compared with the standard of care, which is MitraClip, or the randomized trial that is evaluating TMVR with Tendine versus MitraClip. And for patients who do not have favorable anatomy, you have the ongoing pivotal trials that I already mentioned earlier. So this is how we evaluate patients at our institutions. So to end, um, what's next? Um, I think that we have made a lot of progress in improvement of outcomes, and now we need to uh, make progress in making the procedure less invasive. Uh, this is a uh, patient recently treated with a 3D ice guided uh, transeptal valve valve under conscious sedation. Uh, this was a patient with a very high surgical risk, a Jehovah Witness with a prior AVR and a prior MVR who presents with severe stenosis, highly symptomatic, high risk for many reasons, including also COPD and on, on home oxygen. And the anesthesia team was concerned about um, general anesthesia and intubation. So to make a long story short, we decided to treat this patient with conscious sedation, uh, 3D eyes, as you can see, uh, of, of course, we did our CT analysis to make sure that the anatomy was favorable. No arterial access at all, just two veins, one for the eyes, one for the delivery of the device. And this is, these are the pictures after that. So with this approach, you could discharge patients same day, which can also be, um, you know, attractive, particularly when um, the lack of beds is a problem in the um, COVID era. These are the pictures after. And now just a few days ago, uh, this um, this is from my uh, colleague, Mac Ely, that Mayo, uh, 3D eyes guided under conscious sedation, transeptal valve in MAC, as you can see here, is it uh, eyes catheter and a successful valve in MAC done just with conscious sedation. Um, we're starting to try to use the same approach for lampoon. That's a little bit more challenging, but uh, I do not uh, rule out the possibility of um, moving forward in that direction as well, even for complex cases like lampoon facilitated transeptal valve in MAC. This is a VC slide. I just I won't tell you everything. You can take a snapshot or uh, be happy to send you uh, my slides if you want to have this for reference. What I wanted to highlight here is my own personal journey, particularly for valve in MAC. This summarizes 10 years of work from the uh, uh, idea conception, it starts with when I first had the idea of, can we even do transeptal valve in MAC? And I remember very well when I started thinking about it, it was in January of 2013. Here we are almost 10 years later, 10 years later, and I'm showing you already that we went from the question, can we do it to now do it under conscious sedation with 3D eyes guidance, so that's for me like really, really rewarding. It has been an amazing journey. 
as I mentioned, you start with the idea, then you do, you, you do the first case, and then uh, we started the global registry, and then the mitral trial starts. Uh, we discover um, acute LBT obstruction and um, discovered that bailout alcohol septal ablation is a strategy that you can use to rescue this uh, horrible complication. And then we established the concept of preemptive um, alcohol septal ablation that now not only has helped Balvin-Mac in the mitral trial, but it's also implemented in other trials as well. The um, European guidelines starts to mention our uh, registry work. Um, then we started mitral two and a lot of work, other trials uh, added a MAC arm. And uh, our first mitral two case was last year. And now, like I said, we're moving forward with uh, trying to do this under conscious sedation. So what would happen in the future? I don't know, but my goal would be that someday we can add to this timeline uh, FDA approval um, and uh, maybe changing guidelines where uh, patients who have high risk for surgery could be treated with any of these um, devices that can offer a less invasive option for this patient. So personally for me, an amazing, amazing journey. So in conclusions, uh, there are different patient populations that are candidates for TMDR, and that includes all mitral valvin valve, valvin ring, valvin mac, and the native non-calcified non mitral valve disease. Uh, the early outcomes of TMVR are promising and are improving and continue to improve. And there are already multiple ongoing pivotal clinical trials that are evaluating TMVR, and those include Mitral 2 for MAC, and then Summit, Apollo, and Encircle for both non calcified and also uh, MAC. Uh, thank you very much. And I will stop here and happy to discuss questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Guerrero, for a phenomenal presentation and sharing your inspirational journey and pivotal work in the field. Um, I have a few questions. We, we frequently encounter patients who are high risk and who have severe calcific aortic stenosis and uh, severe mitral stenosis with significant MAC. How do you evaluate these patients with concomitant aortic and mitral valve disease and what would be the treatment algorithm? Yes, thank you for the question. And you're right, uh, that was not included in the algorithm. Um, that is a frequent scenario. And TAVR is a much lower risk procedure that is approved. Uh, we all have experience with that. And for that reason, uh, I think it's important that we treat these patients with TAVR first. So what we do is we uh, proceed with TAVR. We bring them back for the typical one month post tavert follow-up uh, to evaluate symptoms. Because if patients are completely asymptomatic, which is unlikely to be the case, I haven't seen that. But if, so, if a patient comes back and tells you that they, they feel fine, they're able to do anything they want to do without any symptoms, then you could postpone the risk of a valve in MAC procedure. So we bring them back and if they remain symptomatic, we evaluate uh, the possibility of TMVR, TMVR either valvin MAC or uh, a specific device. So that's how we do it, you know, due to the principle of TAVR being an established therapy and also to make sure that uh, TMVR, I'm sorry, that, that mitral uh, pathology continues to drive symptoms after TAVR. But in addition to that, you do have the technical challenges that you could encounter if you were to proceed with the MVR first, for example, because let's say that you do uh, believe that the mitral pathology is the main driver of symptoms. If you do have in MAC, for example, with an aortic device, and then need, you need to do TAVR a month later, you could compromise the stability or the function of the device in the mitral position when you proceed with TAVR because the aortic is a little bit higher and you bring your delivery system, you could compromise the, the function of the mitral valve. So there are technical challenges related as well. Uh, although, you know, that would not be the main reason. The main reason is what I mentioned earlier, but it happens to work well for us um, to have the TAVR device first. And in addition, when you're dealing with valve in MAC, uh, using a sapient device, if you do have a TAVR or any prosthesis in aortic position, 
it could potentially provide additional anchoring in the anterior aspect for the uh, sapien valve in the mitral position. So that's another advantage of dealing with the aortic uh, pathology first. So at our center, that's what we do. If they come with both, we fix um, the aortic pathology first, bring them back at one month, evaluate symptoms, evaluate the mitral valve function, and discuss the options with, with the patients. Thank you so much. We have a question from Dr. Sachin Goel, our Director of Structural Interventions. Great talk, uh, Dr. Guerrero, as always, and thank you for leading this field. Mm -hmm. Two questions. Are there differences in the outcome of TMVR in valve and valve, valve and ring, or valve and MAC, uh, depending on the predominant pathology being MR versus mitral stenosis? Uh, the second question is, what is your septal thickness cutoff for alcohol septal ablation prior to TMVR, below which you found alcohol septal ablation to be unsafe? Thank you. I'll start with the second uh, question. Um, what is the cut of thickness? So in, in the um, multicenter registry of the use of the alcohol ab uh, ablation that I presented, the average thickness was around 1.5. Most of these patients come to us with a thick septum uh, because as I mentioned, most of them have uh, concomitant aortic pathology and therefore um, they associated uh, ventricular hypertrophy that is often present in those patients. So thickness is usually not a limiting factor for us because it's usually 1.5 or greater. Occasionally, you do see a patient who does not have a, a thick septum. And patients who are many, maybe between 1.2 and 1.5, we for those patients, we tend to give less amount of alcohol. Uh, if the thickness is 1.5 or greater, then we're confident that one CC is um, going to give us most likely a good result and no complications in terms of BSD, for example. So usually we, we deliver one CC, not more than that in most cases. So one CC, if it's, uh, the thickness is 1.5. And if it's between 1.2 and 1.5, uh, depending on the size of the branch and um, the um, the amount of contrast that we see at the base of the septum when we do uh, inject echo contrast, we decrease the amount of alcohol to maybe 0 0.75, 0 0.5, and we still are trying to refine that algorithm and hope to share with, um, with all of you. Um, but that's usually what we do. If the thickness is less than 1.1, I think that we do, do need to consider other um, options. And there are usually other options. Um, so I would worry if, uh, if the thickness is, is less than 1.2, for example. So that was um, to answer the, the second question. The first question is, are there any difference in outcomes depending on the predominant uh, pathology uh, according to the types of, um, of patients? I think particularly for, for valvary MAC, my uh, bias is, is yes. And, um, and it depends on the pathology. So for valve and ring, um, usually the pathology is regurgitation. And uh, for the valve and MAC, uh, I think the most often pathology, at least for, for valve and MAC, is stenosis. And uh, I think the uh, outcomes are worse with stenosis because they are um, associated with comorbidities or the associated aortic pathology. But I don't know for sure. I don't have the specific data and the numbers to tell you um, the the difference. I will have to conduct an analysis to provide you with a more scientific answer. Uh, but you're asking a very important question and are giving me an idea for the next analysis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Guerrero. In, in patients who've had surgical repair in the past and have a ring, if they present with mitral regurgitation, obviously a, a valve and ring is always an option. Do you ever evaluate them for a, a clip and ring or do you straight go to a, a valve and ring? Well, uh, usually if the anatomy is favorable for a valve and ring, I think that may be the best option. I think it's all, it all depends on the size of the ring, right? And, and the anatomy. So occasionally you may have a, a, a ring that is just too large to anchor a valve and ring. Um, the, the problem with the tear, uh, with, a, with a mitral clip, is that uh, the unpredictability and the possible 
creation of stenosis. So I would worry about that. I think that uh, TMDR can give you a more um, significant reduction in the degree of mitral regurgitation. And um, if the anatomy is favorable for a valve and ring using a dedicated device, I'm sorry, uh, an aortic device, then I think that's easy to do. Uh, but if the anatomy is not favorable, because for example, it's too large or often rings are incomplete or not rigid or just in the, post the posterior band, for example, those could be included in the encircled trial. And I think both DMVR with the sapient M3 in those patients or transeptal valve and ring with the sapient 3 for patients who have favorable anatomy for that, both procedures will most likely result in more reduction of the mitral regurgitation than a clip and uh, less chances of higher gradients, I think. But we don't have data comparing both. I think it would be important that we continue to collaborate in multicenter registries. Um, we started one actually at Mayo. Uh, one of my uh, colleagues uh, is helping us run that. That's uh, uh, Abdallah, who is, uh, is Abdallah El Sabah, who is at a, a Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville. He and I are collaborating in this registry. So we invite you to, to submit those patients so that we can collect data and, and try to understand which is a better option. As of now, we just don't have enough data to say one or the other, I think, will be uh, depending on anatomy. Perfect. And, and the last question, um, you know, we know that the LVO2 obstruction is the Achilles heel of TMVR. How, how do you envision the tricuspid, transcatheter and tricuspid valve replacement journey to be compared to the, to the mitral journey? Thank you. I had that question at the beginning. Can you have RVOT obstruction? And uh, I don't think that that has uh, been the case or described. Then I also, I think I found one patient with what we call DAC. Mm -hmm. You're just like MAC, like MAC mitral annular calcification, a patient where we saw tricuspid annular calcification. So it was in calcium extending from the, uh, MAC, from the MAC, but very, very tiny amounts. So nothing to compare with, with MAC. So luckily, we're not seeing that type of calcification in the tricuspid valve. And uh, I, I'm not aware of uh, our VOT obstruction as uh, being a problem just like in MAC. So I think in that regard, it's been, um, it's been different and better, but there are other challenges for the tricuspid valve. I think one of the main ones has been the imaging. It's a lot easier to see the mitral valve than the tricuspid valve. And I think the tricuspid interventions field will have different types of um, limiting factors. Perfect. Thank you so very much, Dr. Greer, for joining us. It's been an honor and pleasure having you with us and hopefully you can visit us in, in person in Houston very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. The honor is mine. Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks. You too. Thank you.